Thank you for connecting. This session is sponsored by Miracor Medical and it's about Pixel, a device that is intended to clear the microcirculation and potentially reduce infarct size in STEMI patients. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Adrian Banning from the University Hospitals in Oxford, UK, and also Dr. Azim Latib, now in the United States at Montefiore Hospital, New York. Both colleagues have extensive experience with the device and we will learn from them during this session, how it works, what are the results, and um, what is the future of uh, pixel therapy. But first, let me turn to Azim. Azim, a primary PCI is probably one of the most rewarding procedures we perform as interventionalists, but still, it can and needs to be improved. Can you explain to us what's the need for improvement? Thank you, William. Uh, I agree. I think as interventional cardiologists, we need to start looking beyond the epicardial artery. We're so focused in primary PCI on the epicardial arteries because those are the arteries we can see and so the ones we think we can fix. But if you look at actually the coronary circulation, 95% of the coronary circulation is actually the microcirculation that we can't see. Yet we, do, we, don't, we don't have any techniques or devices right now that can really impact the microcirculation. And you know, I know all the colleagues who do primary PCI, like me, we're frustrated by those cases where we open up the stenosis and a big LED occlusion, and at the end of the procedure, either the TEMI flow is not fully TEMI-3, we don't see a good blush, or we see persistent ST elevation after the procedure. And those are the patients really where we need to do more. If we look at the clinical data as well for primary PCI, I think there's signs suggesting that we need to do more. If we look at what mortality is post-MI, it really has plateaued now uh, at about 10 years, at about 14%. We've done the most we can to decrease the immediate mortality, but there's still patients who present later with heart failure or worsening LV, <clears throat> worsening LV dysfunction. And really the highest group of patients are those with anterior STEMIs who come with occluded arteries. Because these are the patients with really the largest risk of, my, of myocardium at risk. And so the most to lose if they have a large anterior STEMI. And we also know that infarct size, there's more and more data showing that infarct size is correlated to both death and heart failure hospitalization. Right now in the cath lab, all we have to be able to assess the microcirculation is the index of microvascular resistance. But even when we do diagnose that there's microvascular dysfunction, we've been limited in what we can do to treat it. So we do need new devices, new therapies that will help us reduce infarct size and microvascular obstruction. Thank you, Azim. That's very convincing. Um, I'm turning to Adrian. You have extensive experience with PIXO, so tell us everything about the procedure and how it fits in the flow of a primary PCI treatment. Thanks, William. Well, PIXO, pressure-controlled intermittent coronary sinus occlusion, is the passage of a, a balloon up into the coronary sinus from the right femoral vein. Now, during our STEMI procedure, we start off as we normally would with vascular access for the arterial system, open the vessel and get flow. But at that point, we puncture the right femoral vein, cannulate the coronary sinus and introduce the PIXO balloon. That's the little console on the right-hand side there. And on the left-hand side, you can see the typical pressure traces that we get during the PIXO treatment with phasic increases in pressure within the coronary sinus up to a, a, at least 70 millimeters of mercury. And then when the balloon deflates, the coronary sinus pressure falls back to normal, you know, four to five millimeters of mercury. And it's this pressure within the coronary sinus, which is the mechanism of action of PIXO. The mechanism of action, which was initially described by our surgical colleagues and has only more recently been available as, to us as interventional cardiologists on a catheter-based technique, PIXO actually acts by clearing the microcirculation and allowing salvage and detoxification. So ultimately, we're pushing blood into those watershed areas by uh, increases in pressure and allowing the microcirculation to be uh, detoxified and preventing 
further infarction and myocardial death. And in this short film, you can see how the technology is used. This is the balloon, and it's passed up from the, the femoral vein. We cannulate the coronary sinus, as you see, and this is a small coronary sinus angiogram where you can see the balloon in position. Once we've got the PIXO running, we're going to deploy our stent within the coronary artery as usual, because we're trying to treat the downstream myocardium. And this is the uh, balloon up in the coronary sinus, increasing the pressure and pushing the oxygenated blood back towards that damaged myocardium, allowing the microcirculation to return back towards normal. And so this is a unique method of action for this therapy uh, delivered from the venous system uh, to get the blood to the myocardium, which is dysfunctional. Adrian, you know, when you speak to colleagues about this technology, they usually bring up two issues. The one is, will it delay door to balloon times? And I think you showed very nicely that first you restore flow before you actually place the device. The second issue they bring up is whether this delays actually the procedure and whether it takes long to, to implant the device in the coronary sinus. Now, you have a lot of experience and you've been doing this a lot recently. How difficult is it to place the pixel? Well, there is a short learning curve, um, but in my experience, it prolongs the procedure by a relatively short amount. We've got nice data showing only short increases in uh, screening times, probably 30 to 45 minutes, but it fits within the flow of the cath lab pretty well because ultimately you can... Once the patient is comfortable, and the patient is comfortable because the vessel is open, we're administering the therapy. And um, what we haven't seen is that uh, it, it's been sort of uh, caused a problem for us in the lab. So the overall increase in procedure time, probably 30 minutes or so. Um, and if you're using that time to get all the paperwork done and stuff, actually, it's very straightforward. We do this 24 seven. That's great. Um, Adrian, why don't you tell us about, you know, the available data and you've contributed to a very important study called OXAMI. Can you summarize the main findings for us? Uh, as I mentioned, IMR. So an IMR of more than 40 is associated with an adverse outcome. That, that means your microcirculation is dysfunctional and there's a higher risk of death or heart failure. So we took patients with an IMR of more than 40 and treated a proportion of them with PIXO. We then compared them with a control group. And what we saw was that, uh, as you expect, when you complete your primary angioplasty, there is a fall in IMR. That fall in IMR was greater in the PIXO group. But more importantly, there was a statistically significant difference at 24 hours in the IMR in those patients treated with PIXO. Those patients went on to have MRI. And as you see in the right-hand panel, there's a substantial decrease in the infarct size in those patients treated with PIXO. A 7% absolute reduction in infarct size, which is a 33% relative reduction. So that's really quite an important uh, clinical impact for patients receiving the PIXO therapy. So we do seem to be successful in detoxifying and liberating, if you like, the microcirculation. That's terrific. Um, Azim, this was a very nice proof of concept single center study. Uh, can you share for us additional data that are available? Yeah, the data from Oxami is really was reproduced as well in the Pixo CE Mark study. In this study, if you look in the blue graph, it shows infarct size in patients treated with Pixo compared to propensity match controls. And again, you see a very similar 6.9% absolute reduction which correlates with a 33% relative risk uh, infarct size reduction in STEMI patients. But what does that actually mean? So if you take that reduction of infarct size and you model it using previous data uh, published in JAK as to how much that correlates with mortality and heart failure hospitalizations, you see that that infarct size reduction could potentially result in a 34% reduction in heart failure hospitalization at one year and a 25% reduction in mortality. That's overall. But if we look on, on the next slide and we take out the group that's the highest risk. So these are anterior STEMIs with TIMI 0 to 1. So the, the group of patients with the largest amount of myocardium at risk, you see that the benefit is potentially even larger. So here we see a 15.6% absolute reduction and a 49% relative reduction as compared to a reference group. And to me, this is really the group of patients who stand to benefit the most from this technology. 
Thank you very much. So it seems to me that, you know, the device is mature. The need is very strong. You have proof of concept and solid data already, be it from observational studies. You know what to measure, IMR in the cath lab and later on the infarct size. So you're ready for randomized trials, right? So Adrian, please tell us what is the clinical program going forward? Well, it's a very exciting clinical program. We've already started our first trial in Europe. 144 patients will be randomized to either PIXO or control therapy. Um, that will be then supplemented by a US trial of nearly 400 patients and a further trial in France of 250 patients. These trials will have similar uh, trial uh, protocols, inclusion and exclusion criteria. So we expect to be able to build a very strong database to show the potential for this therapy in these at-risk patient groups to, to see you know, whether we can fill this unmet need for patients presented with acute myocardial infarction. And very excitingly, the FDA have recently granted this technology breakthrough designation. And that's really a reflection, I think, both of the potential for the therapy, but also the recognition of the unmet need that we all as clinicians recognize in the cath lab, where we just can't do any more for the patients who seem to be most at need. That's really amazing. So, dear colleagues, uh, I'd, I'd like to thank you, uh, both Azim and Adrian, for summarizing these data. And um, to you listening, if, if you're running a large primary PCI program, I think you should probably look into this technology. And of course, all of us, we are very keen and uh, to see and can't wait for the results of these large randomized trials that are in the planning or actually have started. So thank you very much again for connecting and for listening until the end.